Act Three of As You Like It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. As You Like It by William Shakespeare. Act Three. Scene One A Room in the Palace. Enter Duke Frederick, Lords, and Oliver. Not see him since? Sir, sir, that cannot be be but were i not the better part made mercy i should not seek an absent argument of my revenge thou present but look to it find out thy brother wheresoe'er he is seek him with a candle bring him dead or living within this twelvemonth or turn thou no more to seek a living in our territory thy lands and all things that thou dost call thine worth seizure do we seize into our hands till thou canst quit thee by thy brother's mouth of what we think against thee Oh, that your highness knew my heart in this! I have never loved my brother in my life. More villain thou! Well, push him out of doors, and, and let my officers of such a nature make an extent upon his house and lands. Do this expediently, and turn him going. Exeunt. Scene two. The forest. Enter Orlando with a paper. Hang there my verse in witness of my love, and thou thrice crowned queen of night survey with thy chaste eye from thy pale sphere above thy huntress name that my full life doth sway o oh, rosalind these trees shall be my books and in their barks my thoughts all character that every eye which in this forest looks shall see thy virtue witnessed everywhere run run orlando carve on every tree the fair the chaste and unexpressive she Exit. Enter Corin and Touchstone. And how like you this shepherd's life, Master Touchstone? Truly, shepherd, in respect of itself it is a good life, but in respect that it is a shepherd's life it is not. In respect that it is solitary I like it very well, but in respect that it is private it is a very vile life. Now, in respect it is in the fields it pleaseth me well but in respect it is not in the court, it is tedious. As it is a spare life, look you, it fits my humour well, but as there is no more plenty in it, it goes much against my stomach. Hast any philosophy in thee, shepherd? No more, but that I know the more one sickens, the worse at ease he is, and that he that wants money, means and content, is without three good friends, that the property of rain is to wet, and fire to burn, that good pasture makes fat sheep, and that a great cause of the night is lack of the sun, that he that hath learned no wit by nature, nor art, may complain of good breeding, or comes of a very dull kindred. Such a one is a natural philosopher. Wast ever in court, shepherd? No, truly. Then thou art damned. Nay, I hope. Truly, thou art damned like an ill-roasted egg, all on one side. For not being at court, your reason why if thou never wast at court thou never sawest good manners if thou never sawest good manners then thy manners must be wicked and wickedness is sin and sin is damnation thou art in a parlous state shepherd not a whit touchstone those that are good manners at the court are as ridiculous in the country as the behaviour of the country is most mockable at the court you told me you salute not at the court but you kiss your hands that courtesy would be uncleanly if courtiers were shepherds. Instance, briefly. Come, instance. Why, we are still handling our ewes, and their fells, you know, are greasy. Why do not your courtiers' hands sweat? And is not the grease of a mutton as wholesome as the sweat of a man? Shallow, shallow. A better instance, I say. Come. Besides, our hands are hard. Your lips will feel them the sooner shallow again a more sounder instance come and they are often tarred over with the sugary of our sheep and would you have us kiss tar the courtier's hands are perfumed with civet most shallow man thou worm's meat in respect of a good piece of flesh indeed learn of the wise and perpend civet is of a baser birth than tar the very uncleanly flux of a cat mend the instance shepherd you have too courtly a wit for me. I'll rest. Wilt thou rest, damned? God help thee, shallow man. God makes incision in thee. Thou art raw. Sir, I am a true labourer. I earn that I eat. 
get that I wear, owe no man hate, envy no man's happiness, glad of other men's good, content with my harm, and the greatest of my pride is to see my ewes graze and my lambs suck. That is another simple sin in you, to bring the ewes and the rams together, and to offer to get your living by the copulation of cattle, to be bawed to a bellwether, and to betray a she-lamb of a twelve-month to a crooked-pated old cuckoldy ram, out of all reasonable match. If thou beest not damned for this, the devil himself will have no shepherds. I cannot see else how thou shouldst escape." Here comes young Master Ganymede, my new mistress's brother. Enter Rosalind with a paper, reading. From the east to western end, no jewel is like Rosalind. Her worth being mounted on the wind, through all the world bears Rosalind. All the pictures fairest lined are but black to Rosalind. Let no fair be kept in mind, but the fair of Rosalind. I'll rhyme you so eight years together, dinners and suppers and sleeping hours excepted. It is the right butterwoman's rank to mark it. Out, fool! For a taste, if a heart do lack a hind, let him seek out Rosalind. If the cat will after kind, so be sure will Rosalind. Winter garments must be lined, so must slender Rosalind. They that reap must sheaf and bind then to cart with rosalind sweetest nut has sourest rind such a nut is rosalind she that sweetest rose will find must find love's prick and rosalind this is the very false gallop of verses why do you infect yourself with them peace you dull fool i found them on a tree truly the tree yields bad fruit i'll graph it with you and then i shall graph it with a medlar and then it will be the earliest fruit of the country, for you'll be rotten ere you be half ripe, and that's the right virtue of a medlar. You have said, but whether wisely or no, let the forest judge. Enter Celia with a writing. Peace, here comes my sister reading. Stand aside. Reads. Why should this a desert be? For it is unpeopled, no. Tongues I'll hang on every tree that shall civil sayings show. Some, how brief the life of man, runs his erring pilgrimage, That the stretching of a span buckles in his sum of age. Some, of violated vows, twixt the souls of friend and friend, But upon the fairest boughs, or at every sentence end, Will I Rosalinda write, Teaching all that read to know the quintessence of every sprite Heaven would in little show. Therefore heaven nature charged that one body should be filled with all graces wide enlarged. Nature presently distilled Helen's cheek, but not her heart, Cleopatra's majesty, Atalanta's better part, sad Lucretia's modesty. Thus Rosalind of many parts by a heavenly synod was devised. Of many faces, eyes, and hearts to have the touches dearest prized. Heaven would that she these gifts should have, and I to live and die her slave. O oh, most gentle pulpiter, what tedious homily of love have you wearied your parishioners withal, and never cried, Have patience, good people! How now? Back, friends. Shepherd, go off a little. Go with him, sirrah. Come, shepherd, let us make an honourable retreat, though not with bag and baggage, yet with scrip and scrippage. Exeunt Corin and Touchstone. Didst thou hear these verses? Oh, yes, I heard them all, and more, too, for some of them had in them more feet than the verses would bear. That's no matter, the feet might bear the verses. Ay, but the feet were lame, and could not bear themselves without the verse, and therefore stood lamely in the verse. But didst thou hear without wondering how thy name should be hanged and carved upon these trees? I was seven of the nine days out of the wonder before you came, for look here what I found on a palm tree. I was never so berhymed since Pythagoras's time that I was an Irish rat, which I can hardly remember. Trow you who hath done this. Is it a man? And a chain that you once wore about his neck. Change you colour? I prithee who? 
oh lord lord it is a hard matter for friends to meet but mountains may be removed with earthquakes and so encounter nay but who is it is it possible nay i prithee now with the most petitionary vehemence tell me who it is oh wonderful wonderful and most wonderful wonderful and yet again wonderful and after that out of all hooping good my complexion dost thou think though i am caparisoned like a man i have a doublet and hose in my disposition one inch of delay more is a south sea of discovery i prithee tell me who it is quickly and speak apace i would thou couldst stammer that thou mightst pour this concealed man out of thy mouth as wine comes out of a narrow-mouthed bottle either too much at once or none at all i prithee take the cork out of thy mouth that i may drink thy tidings so you may put a man in your belly is he of god's making what manner of man is his head worth a hat or his chin worth a beard nay he hath but a little beard why god will send more if the man will be thankful let me stay the growth of his beard if thou delay me not the knowledge of his chin it is young orlando that tripped up the wrestler's heels and your heart both in an instant nay but the devil take mocking speak sad brow and true maid if faith cause tis he orlando orlando alas the day what shall i do with my doublet and hose what did he when thou sawest him what said he how looked he wherein went he what makes he here did he ask for me where remains he how parted he with thee and when shalt thou see him again answer me in one word <laughs> you must borrow me gargantua's mouth first tis a word too great for any mouth of this age's size to say i and no to these particulars is more than to answer in a catechism but doth he know that i am in this forest and in man's apparel looks he as freshly as he did the day he wrestled it is as easy to count atomies as to resolve the propositions of a lover but take a taste of my finding him and relish it with good observance i found him under a tree like a dropped acorn it may well be called jove's tree when it drops forth such fruit give me audience good madam proceed there lay he stretched along like a wounded knight though it be pity to see such a sight it well becomes the ground cry holler to thy tongue i prithee it curvets unseasonably he was furnished like a hunter oh ominous he comes to kill my heart i would sing my song without a burden thou bringest me out of tune do you not know i am a woman when i think i must speak sweet say on you bring me out soft comes he not here enter orlando and jaques tis he slink by and note him i thank you for your company but good faith i had as lief have been myself alone and so had i but yet for fashion's sake i thank you too for your society god be with you let's meet as little as we can i do desire we may be better strangers i pray you mar no more trees with writing love-songs in their barks i pray you mar no more of my verses with reading them ill-favouredly rosalind is your love's name yes just i do not like her name there was no thought of pleasing you when she was christened what stature is she of just as high as my heart ah <laughs> you are full of pretty answers have you not been acquainted with goldsmiths wives and conned them out of rings not so but i answer you right painted cloth from whence you have studied your questions you have a nimble wit i think twas made of atalanta's heels will you sit down with me and we two will rail against our mistress the world and all our misery i will chide no breather in the world save myself against whom i know most faults the worst fault you have is to be in love tis a fault i will not change for your best virtue i weary of you by my troth i was seeking for a fool when i found you he is drowned in the brook look but in and you shall see him there i shall see mine own figure which i take to be either a fool or a cipher i'll tarry no longer with you farewell good signor love i am glad of your departure adieu good monsieur melancholy exit jaques aside to celia i will speak to him like a saucy lackey and under that habit play the knave with him 
Do you hear, Forrester? Very well. What would you? I pray you, what is de clock? You should ask me what time a day. There's no clock in the forest. And there is no true lover in the forest, else sighing every minute and groaning every hour would detect the lazy foot of time as well as the clock. And why not the swift foot of time? Had not that been as proper? By no means, sir. Time travels in diverse paces with diverse persons. I'll tell you who time ambles with all, who time trots with all, who time gallops with all, and who he stands still with all. I prithee, who does he trot with all? Mary, he trots hard with a young maid, between the contract of her marriage and the day it is solemnized. If the interim be but a sudden night, time's pace is so hard it seems the length of seven year. Who ambles time with all? With a priest that lacks Latin, and a rich man that hath not the gout. For the one sleeps easily because he cannot study, and the other lives merrily because he feels no pain. The one lacking the burden of lean and wasteful learning, the other knowing no burden of heavy, tedious penury. These time ambles withal. Who doth he gallop withal? With a thief to the gallows. For though he go as softly as foot can fall, he thinks himself too soon there. Who stays it still withal? With lawyers in the vacation. For they sleep between term and term and then they perceive not how time moves. Where dwell you, pretty youth? With the shepherdess, my sister, here on the skirts of the forest, like fringe upon a petticoat. Are you native of this place? As the coney that you see dwell where she is kindled. Your accent is something finer than you could purchase in so removed a dwelling. I have been told so of many, but, indeed, an old religious uncle of mine taught me to speak, who was in his youth an inland man one that knew courtship too well, for there he fell in love. I have heard him read many lectures against it, and I thank God I am not a woman, to be touched with so many giddy offences as he hath generally taxed their whole sex withal. Can you remember any of the principal evils that he laid to the charge of women? There were none principal. They were all as like one another as halfpence are, every one fault seeming monstrous till his fellow fault came to match it. I prithee recount some of them. No, I will not cast away my physic, but on those who are sick. There is a man haunts this forest that abuses our young plants with carving Rosalind on their barks, hangs odes upon hawthorns and elegies on brambles, all forsooth deifying the name of Rosalind. If I could meet that fancy monger, I would give him some good counsel, for he seems to have the quotidian of love upon him. I am he that is so love-shaked. I pray you, tell me your remedy. There is none of my uncle's marks upon you. He taught me how to know a man in love, in which cage of rushes I am sure you are not prisoner. What were his marks? A lean cheek, which you have not. A blue eye and sunken, which you have not. An unquestionable spirit, which you have not. A beard neglected, which you have not. But I pardon you for that, for simply your having in beard is a younger brother's revenue. Then your hose should be ungartered, your bonnet unbanded, your sleeve unbuttoned, your shoe untied, and everything about you demonstrating a careless desolation. But you are no such man. You are rather point device in your accoutrements, as loving yourself than seeming the lover of any other. Fair youth, I wish I could make thee believe. I love. Me believe it. You may as soon make her that you love believe it, which I warrant she is apter to do than confess she does. That is one of the points in the which women still give the lie to their consciences. But in good sooth, are you he that hangs the verses on the trees wherein Rosalind is so admired? I swear to thee, youth, by the white hand of Rosalind, I am that he, that unfortunate he. But are you so much in love as your rhymes speak? Neither rhyme nor reason can express how much. Love is merely a madness and I tell you deserves as well a dark house and a whip as madmen do. And the reason why they are not so punished and cured is that the lunacy is so ordinary that the whippers are in love, too. Yet I profess curing it by counsel. Did you ever cure any so? Yes, one, and in this manner. He was to imagine me his love, his mistress, and I set him every day to woo me, at which time would I, being but a moonish youth, Grieve, be effeminate, changeable, longing and liking, proud, fantastical, apish, shallow, inconstant, full of tears, full of smiles, for every passion something, and for no passion truly anything, as boys and women are for the most part cattle of this color, 
would now like him, now loathe him, then entertain him, then forswear him, then weep for him, then spit at him, that I drave my suitor from his mad humour of love to a living humour of madness, which was to forswear the whole stream of the world, and to live in a nook merely monastic. And thus I cured him. And this way will I take it upon me to wash your liver as clean as a sound sheep's heart, that there shall not be one spot of love in it. I would not be cured, youth. I would cure you, if you would but call me Rosalind, and come every day to my coat and woo me. Now, by the faith of my love, I will. Tell me where it is. Go with me to it, and I'll show it you, and by the way you shall tell me where in the forest you live. Will you go? With all my heart, good youth. Nay, you must call me Rosalind. Come, sister, will you go? Exeunt. Scene three, the forest. Enter Touchstone and Audrey, Jaques behind. Come apace, good Audrey. I will fetch up your goats, Audrey. And how, Audrey? Am I the man yet? Doth my simple feature content you? Your feet says. Lord warrant us, what feet says? I am here with thee and thy goats, as the most capricious poet honest Ovid was among the Goths. Aside. O oh, knowledge ill inhabited, worse than Jove in a thatched house. When a man's verses cannot be understood, nor a man's good wit seconded with the forward child, understanding, it strikes a man more dead than a great reckoning in a little room. Truly, I would the gods had made thee poetical. I do not know what poetical is. Is it honest indeed in word? Is it a true thing? No, truly, for the truest poetry is the most feigning, and lovers are given to poetry, and what they swear in poetry may be said as lovers they do feign. Do you wish, then, that the gods had made me poetical? I do, truly. For thou swearest to me thou art honest. Now, if thou wert a poet, I might have some hope thou didst feign. Would you not have me honest? No, truly, unless thou wert hard favoured, for honesty coupled to beauty is to have honey a sauce to sugar. Aside. A material fool. Well, I am not fair, and therefore I pray the gods make me honest. Truly, and to cast away honesty upon a foul slut were to put good meat into an unclean dish. I am not a slut, though I thank the gods I am foul. Well, praise be the gods for thy foulness. Sluttishness may come hereafter. But be it as it may be, I will marry thee, and to that end I have been with Sir Oliver Martext, the vicar of the next village, who hath promised to meet me in this place of the forest and to couple us. Aside, I would fain see this meeting. Well, the gods give us joy. Amen. A man may, if he were of a fearful heart, stagger in this attempt, for here we have no temple but the wood, no assembly but horn-beasts. But what, though? Courage! As horns are odious, they are necessary. It is said, many a man knows no end of his goods right, Many a man has good horns, and knows no end of them. Well, that is the dowry of his wife. Tis none of his own getting. Horns? Even so. Poor men alone? No, no, the noblest deer hath them as huge as the rascal. Is the single man therefore blessed? No. As a walled town is more worthier than a village, so is the forehead of a married man more honourable than the bare brow of a bachelor and by how much defence is better than no skill, by so much is a horn more precious than to want. Here comes Sir Oliver. Enter Sir Oliver Martext. Sir Oliver Martext, you are well met. Will you dispatch us here under this tree, or shall we go with you to your chapel? Is there none here to give the woman? I will not take her on gift of any man. Truly, she must be given, or the marriage is not lawful. Advancing. Proceed. Proceed, I'll give her. Good even, good master, what do you call it? How do you, sir? You are very well met. God ill you for your last company. I am very glad to see you. Even a toy in hand here, sir. Nay, pray be covered. Will you be married, Motley? As the ox hath his bow, sir. 
the horse his curb and the falcon her bells, so man hath his desires, and as pigeons bill, so wedlock would be nibbling. And will you, being a man of your breeding, be married under a bush like a beggar? Get you to church, and have a good priest that can tell you what marriage is. This fellow will but join you together as they join wainscot. Then one of you will prove a shrunk panel, and, like green timber, warp, warp. Aside, I am not in the mind, but I were better to be married of him than of another, for he is not like to marry me well, and, not being well married, it will be a good excuse for me hereafter to leave my wife. Go thou with me, and let me counsel thee. Come, sweet Audrey, we must be married, or we must live in Baudry. Farewell, good Master Oliver. Not, O oh, sweet Oliver, O oh, brave Oliver, leave me not behind thee, but wind away, be gone, I say, I will not to wedding with thee. Exeunt, Jaques, Touchstone, and Audrey. Tis no matter, ne'er a fantastical knave of them all shall flout me out of my calling. Exit. Scene four, The Forest. Enter Rosalind and Celia. Never talk to me, I will weep. Do, I prithee but yet have the grace to consider that tears do not become a man. But have I not cause to weep? As good a cause as one would desire, therefore weep. His very hair is of the dissembling colour. Something browner than Judas's, marry, his kisses are Judas's own children. If faith, his hair is of a good colour. An excellent colour. Your chestnut was ever the only colour. And his kissing is as full of sanctity as the touch of holy bread. He hath bought a pair of cast lips of Diana. A nun of winter's sisterhood kisses not more religiously. The very ice of chastity is in them. But why did he swear he would come this morning, and comes not? Nay, certainly there is no truth in him. Do you think so? Yes. I think he is not a pick-purse nor a horse-stealer. But for his verity in love, I do think him as concave as a covered goblet or a worm-eaten nut. Not true in love? Yes, when he is in. But I think he is not in. You have heard him swear, downright he was. Was is not is. Besides, the oath of a lover is no stronger than the word of a tapster. They are both the confirmer of false reckonings. He attends here in the forest on the duke your father. I met the duke yesterday, and had much question with him. He asked me of what parentage I was. I told him of as good as he. So he laughed and let me go. But what talk we of fathers when there's such a man as Orlando? Oh, that's a brave man. He writes brave verses, speaks brave words, swears brave oaths, and breaks them bravely, quite traverse a thought the heart of his lover, as a puny tilter that spurs his horse but on one side, breaks his staff like a noble goose. But all's brave that youth mounts and folly guides. Who comes here? Enter Corin. Mistress and master, you have oft inquired after the shepherd that complained of love who you saw by me sitting on the turf, praising the proud, disdainful shepherdess that was his mistress. Well, and what of him? If you will see a pageant truly played, between the pale complexion of true love and the red glow of scorn and proud disdain, go hence a little, and I shall conduct you, if you will mark it. Oh, come, let us remove. The sight of lovers feedeth those in love. Bring us to this sight, and you shall say I'll prove a busy actor in their play. Exeunt. Scene five. Another part of the forest. Enter Silvius and Phoebe. Sweet Phoebe, do not scorn me, do not, Phoebe. Say that you love me not, but say not so in bitterness. The common executioner, whose heart the accustomed sight of death makes hard, falls not the axe upon the humbled neck, but first begs pardon. Will you sterner be than he that dies and lives by bloody drops? Enter Rosalind, Celia, and Corin behind. I would not be thy executioner. I fly thee, for I would not injure thee. Thou tells me there is murder in mine eye. Tis pretty sure, and very probable, that eyes, that are the frailest and softest things, who shut their coward gates on atomies, should be called tyrants, butchers, murderers. Now I do frown on thee with all my heart, and if mine eyes can wound, now let them kill thee. 
not counterfeit to swoon, why not fall down? Or if thou canst not, oh, for shame, for shame, lie not to say mine eyes are murderers. Thou show the wound mine eye hath made in thee. Scratch thee but with a pin, and there remains some scar of it. Lean but upon a rush, the cicatrice and capable impression thy palm some moment keeps. But now mine eyes, which I have darted at thee, hurt thee not. Nor I am sure there is no force in eyes that can do hurt. Oh, dear Phoebe, if ever, as that ever may be near, you meet in some fresh cheek the power of fancy, then shall you know the wounds invisible that love's keen arrows make. But till that time, come not thou near me, and when that time comes, afflict me with thy mocks, pity me not, as till that time I shall not pity thee. And why, I pray you? Who might be your mother that you insult, exult, and all at once over the wretched? What, though you have no beauty, as by my faith I see no more in you than without candle may go dark to bed, must you be therefore proud and pitiless? Why, what means this? Why do you look on me? I see no more in you than in the ordinary of nature's sail work. Odds my little life, I think she means to tangle my eyes, too. No, faith, proud mistress, hope not after it. "'Tis not your inky brows, your black silk hair, your bugle eyeballs, nor your cheek of cream that can entame my spirits to your worship. You foolish shepherd, wherefore do you follow her, like foggy south, puffing with wind and rain? You are a thousand times a properer man than she a woman. "'Tis such fools as you that make this world full of ill-favoured children. "'Tis not her glass, but you that flatters her, and out of you she sees herself more proper than any of her lineaments can show her. "'But, mistress, know yourself.' down on your knees and thank heaven, fasting for a good man's love. For I must tell you friendly in your ear, sell when you can. You are not for all markets. Cry the man mercy, love him, take his offer. Foul is most foul, being foul to be a scoffer. So take her to thee, shepherd. Fare you well. Sweet youth, I pray you, chide a year together. I had rather hear you chide than this man woo. He's fallen in love with your foulness, and she'll fall in love with my anger. If it be so, as fast as she answers thee with frowning looks, I'll saucer with bitter words. Why look you so upon me? For no ill will I bear you. I pray you, do not fall in love with me, for I am falser than vows made in wine. Besides, I like you not. If you will know my house, tis at the tuft of olives here hard by. Will you go, sister? Shepherd, ply her hard. Come, sister, shepherdess, look on him better, and be not proud. Though all the world could see, none could be so abused in sight as he. Come, to our flock. Exeunt, Rosalind, Celia, and Corin. Dead shepherd, now I find thy saw of might. Whoever loved that loved not at first sight. Sweet Phoebe? Uh, what sayst thou, Silvius? Sweet Phoebe, pity me. Why, I am sorry for thee, gentle Silvius. Wherever sorrow is, relief would be. If you do sorrow at my grief in love, by giving love, your sorrow and my grief were both extermined. Thou hast my love, is not that neighbourly? I would have you. Why, that were covetousness. Silvius, the time was that I hated thee, and yet it is not that I bear thee love. But since that thou canst talk of love so well, thy company, which irks was irksome to me, I will endure, and I'll employ thee too. But do not look for further recompense than thine own gladness that thou art employed. So holy and so perfect is my love, and I in such a poverty of grace, that I shall think it a most plenteous crop to glean the broken ears after the man that the main harvest reaps. Loose now and then a scattered smile, and that I'll live upon. Knowest now the youth that spoke to me erewhile? Not very well, but I have met him oft, and he hath bought the cottage and the bounds that the old carlet once was master of. Think not I love him, though I ask for him. Tis but a peevish boy, yet he talks well. But what care I for words? Yet words do well, when he that speaks them pleases those that hear. It is a pretty youth, not very pretty, but sure he's proud, and yet his pride becomes him. 
He'll make a proper man. The best thing in him is his complexion, and faster than his tongue did make offense, his eye did heal it up. He's not very tall, yet for his years he's tall. His leg is but so-so, and yet tis well. There was a pretty redness in his lip, a little riper and more lusty red than that mixed in his cheek. Twas just the difference between the constant red and mingled damask. There be some women, Silvius, had they marked him in parcels as I did, would have gone near to fall in love with him. But for my part, I love him not, nor hate him not. And yet I have more cause to hate him than to love him. For what had he to do to chide at me? He said mine eyes were black and my hair black, and now I am remembered, scorned at me. I marvel why I answered not again. But that's all one. Omittance is no quittance. I'll write to him a very taunting letter, and thou shalt bear it, wilt thou, Silvius? Phoebe, with all my heart. I'll write it straight, the matter's in my head and in my heart. I will be bitter with him and passing short. Go with me, Silvius. Exeunt. End of Act Three.